Hello everyone and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Micaela. I'm the Managing Director and Founder of Connections. A very, very warm welcome to our first Connect Talks of this event, Asia-Pacific Recovery and Resurgence. So thank you very much for joining us. There will be a few more people um, joining us throughout, um, but I hope they will catch up on our conversation. I hope the event is going well so far. Thank you very much for spending the time with us here today. But before we begin, I wanted to briefly um, share a little bit about our panelists. I'm going to start with Mario. Mario Hardy is the Chief Executive Officer of the Pacific Asia Travel Association, PATA, a nonprofit organization acting as a catalyst for the responsible development of Asia Pacific travel and tourism industry. Investor, entrepreneur, and senior executives with more than 30 years of combined leadership, corporate development, and change management experience, Mario's focus has been on shaping and implementing strategies that inspire teams in unlocking their full potential. Mario join us, joins us from Bangkok. Welcome, Mario. Next, we have Shoba Moha. She is the founder of and partner of Rare India, a company that has been promoting conservation and community-based tourism with sustainability as a keystone value for tourism and hospitality. Rare India's list comprises a unique collection of hotels spanning four countries, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. A prolific blogger and writer, Shoba also submits columns regularly for trade and lifestyle magazines like Condé Nast, Outlook Traveller, Travel Plus Leisure and India. With over 20 years in the travel hospitality, Shoba sits on several boards associations and promotes the idea that sustainable travel is future ready and luxury has to be redefined around parameters that believe in protection and preservation of the planet. Today, Shoba joins us in one of the highest lands of the world, Ladakh, the land of the high passes. And I hope you're okay with oxygen levels, but I, I hear you've been there for three days and you've been acclimatizing. Yes, I am. Um, thank you. Welcome, Shoba. Um, and then we have Amanda Sirowatka who is the owner and general manager of Viceroy Bali, a family owned and operated luxury hotel in the serene mountains of Ubu. Amanda's family designed and built the hotel in 2005, having expanded and renovated over the years to make it what it is today. Travel has always been a passion in her family, having grown up in Australia but taking exotic and engaging trips around the world before falling in love with the Balinese people and the way of life there. In her spare time, she likes to go scuba diving at some great spots around the Indonesian archipelago and Amanda joins us from beautiful Bali. So welcome, Amanda. So welcome to all the speaker and thanks again for taking the time to be with us today. Now, during this session, we will focus on the latest news and developments across the region and predictions for the year ahead. But before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm sure many of you now would have used Zoom and you're very familiar with it, but if not, please can I ask you all to place yourself on mute. During the session, ask any questions using the chat button, which appears at the bottom of your screen. And my team and I are here on hand if you want to direct them any questions at any time, and we will try to answer as many as possible. The session will, uh, will last up to 45 minutes to an hour and is being recorded. So if you have any colleagues or friends who might find this, this session useful, we will be distributing the recording in the coming days. Um, finally, as this session is live, we all love technology and we trust it dearly, but anything can happen. If for any reason we're disconnected, bear with us and we will uh, reconnect as soon as possible. So I will start um, with, well, Shoba, Amanda and Mario, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, Mario, I'll start with you. Good morning. 
Perhaps you can start by giving our audience a little bit of an overview about the current situation across Asia Pacific. Sure, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you again today. Um, across Asia Pacific, it's in the past, it was actually much easier to give you an overview of the entire region in one go. Uh, now it's nearly impossible because each country's situation varies uh, quite a lot between, between the, the various regions. So, but if I, if I give you maybe the countries that are actually are, uh, or the destinations who are maybe doing a little bit better than others at the moment are Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, and Chinese Taipei. Uh, when we think about, you know, everyone questioned that I get asked in multiple times a day is when? <laughs> when are we going to reopen the borders? Um, those three destinations at the moment are probably ahead of others in terms of reopening. Uh, Singapore is even talking about reopening sometime in March uh, for business corridors, for business travel, in a very innovative and, and uh, concept that I, I don't think any of us have ever experienced before where business travel, travelers will travel to Shangi Airport at the airport itself and a building adjacent to, to the airport. People will be escorted to that building where uh, conference rooms have been transformed into hotels where people will be able to stay. Uh, there are actually meeting rooms with fiberglass on each side. So Singaporeans will sit on one side, the visitors will sit on the other side and they can have their meetings essentially face to face but segregated by a plexiglass. Um, do their business, sign their deals or whatever they're negotiating, and take, be escorted back to the flight up and return to their country without quarantines. Uh, testing will still be done, for example. So that's one new way that actually Singapore is looking at gradually and slowly restarting travel. It's not the ideal, it's not what we experienced before. People won't be able to go and visit the city or go to bars and restaurants and et cetera, but they'll be able to do their business. Hong Kong, Chinese Taipei have actually also started their vaccinations uh, as Singapore has quite early and uh, progressing quite well. Other destinations around the region here are only starting vaccination uh, in the next uh, week or so. Uh, Cambodia started, Vietnam has started already uh, a few months ago, but Thailand, Malaysia, Korea, as well as Australia, are actually starting uh, vaccination this week. Thailand starts on Wednesday. And, uh, so our expectations from, from, as an organization is that we don't expect necessarily a, a, a fast recovery. It'll be a slow recovery. We hope that by the third and fourth quarter, there'll be some cross-border travel between ASEAN countries uh, through different corridors that will be established. And into 2022, gradually countries will start to reopen to each other with anticipation that sometime probably in the third and fourth quarter 2022, will have more flexibility for travel. Now you have to understand that these scenarios, as I call them, they change by the day. Uh, things, it's a very fast evolving situation. And so what we've done a few weeks ago is Pat has published uh, our annual forecasts, which I, I don't like to use the word forecast at the moment because it's really impossible to forecast anything long-term. So instead of looking at five years, now we're looking at three years, and we're doing it into various scenarios, best case, kind of average scenario, and the worst case scenario. If I had to put my guess on where we'll end up, I'd say it's between the worst and the average, not the best case scenario. Certainly based on today's facts and what we know today. As I said in a few weeks time, if vaccination accelerates, number of cases start to reduce across the region, countries start to reopen, maybe things will end up a little bit better at the end of the year. Uh, there is one situation or one item that needs to be resolved across the region here is actually standardizations or harmonizations of health protocols and border crossing protocols to ensure that it's actually easy for people to travel from one place to another without having to carry hopefully 10 different applications and 10 different QR codes as they cross from one country to another. Um, Sadly, I think for a short term, we might end up in situations where we'll have different protocols. There'll be some complexity in travel. The example of Singapore is a good one. Um, but hopefully by sometime next year, uh, health pass or passport, as we want to call it, will become more consistent used uh, across the, 
preferably across the world. At the very least, I'm hoping within the ASEAN uh, countries. So kind of give you a rough update as to where we are. Uh, I'd like to remain positive that actually things are moving in the right directions. They're certainly better than they were a few months ago, uh, but still a long way to go before we get back to you know, full travel as we experienced before COVID-19. Thank you, Mario. Uh, I, it's, it is quite challenging because obviously it's a vast region and, um, and everyone has got their own protocols, but definitely standardization is something that not only Asia Pacific, but the entire world will have to come to grips with um, if we are to, to, to live in, a, in an international world and in a global world, which increasingly so we have been experiencing. So the cat is out of the bag. We just need to see how we deal with a cat moving forward. Yeah. Uh, sadly, I have a friend who, who traveled to South America from Spain uh, over the Christmas holidays. And she was actually sharing her experience of traveling. And when I reset 10 application, 10 QR codes, I was referring to her trip, which is essentially what she had to go to to get to her destination. There's different application, different QR codes from different point of entries at different places. She eventually got home. Uh, it took her a much longer time than uh, she would have had in the past. Um, and with some complexity, but eventually actually got to her destination. So hopefully these 10 QR codes and application will be downsized to either one or two in the future. And how long, just as a matter of interest, did she take to get back home? From where was she traveling to Spain, you uh, said? From Spain to Colombia. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how long it took her, but it was a while. <laughs> so, yeah. There was no direct service, so she had to make a couple of connections. But. Not surprised at all. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, Amanda, what about the situation in Bali? The situation in Bali, it's been closed now since 20th of January last year. Um, that was Nyepi Day, which is the day of silence when the international airport does usually close for one day anyway, but they then just shut that down completely. So we're coming up on a year. Uh, there is some positive no news though out of Bali. So we they are looking at we over christmas time they brought out a business visa and trialed that for a few months and then shut it down as they saw covid cases increasing and that was an international business visa that cost you around about three or four hundred dollars but then you could get into bali and stay for up to one one or two months uh, we saw a lot of eastern european or russians take that up because they generally travel to bali in january anyway because of their holidays um, the orthodox christmas and new year's so we did see a little bit of a surge and we had some people here on business visas, but then now things have closed back down for the last month, but they're talking about bringing back that business visa. So like Mario said, every situation is different, but they're also looking at some international tourist corridors. If you've got your vaccination passport and you do a swab test on arrival and all this sort of stuff. Uh, so Bali started back a couple of weeks ago or sorry, mid-January for the first round, which was for medical staff. Uh, the second round has actually been brought forward to start next week or Wednesday. Uh, so that'll be 130,000 doses that have just come into Bali. They're all being based out of Dempasar hospitals. And next they're going to be treating uh, those at risk. But also interestingly, they're putting a focus on hospitality and tourism workers or anyone that's front facing that would actually deal with tourists. So they want to get Bali up and running again, uh, which is exciting. But of course, we know that this is still a long process and it's going to take a while. But there is a lot of positive talk and energy here. Um, it's been a long year with, I would have never imagined Bali without any international tourists. It's very quiet. But there is, like I said, some positive things to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And a beautiful background, by the way, even yeah. though it's a cloudy day. Um, it's, it's really yeah, we've got the full, full jungle views here. Oh, wow. Look at that. Beautiful. Very beautiful. Is it very humid? Uh, today's actually quite nice. But yes, in the last couple of months, it has been very humid. But we're coming out of that rainy season now. Oh, fantastic. Well, let's hope can open to international tourism very, very soon. Thank you for this overview. Um, Shoba, hello. Would you like to give us an overview of India and Sri Lanka and have a bit of a drill down into those two? Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Um, like uh, Michaela pointed out, I'm 
talking to you probably from uh, what is called as the roof of the world at about 12,000 feet, uh, but it's absolutely sunny and beautiful here and quite warmer than what it was last February. This is also my first, um, uh, you know, first event, first physical event I'm going out to. Just to reiterate that uh, at least uh, domestic travel in India is, um, is something that started in August, September and uh, uh, the industry, especially the hotels are actually, um, you know, making, uh, are, are actually making the best out of the situation by targeting the domestic audience. That said, um, we are still close to uh, international travelers. Uh, and uh, there was a talk about, uh, you know, uh, opening up to visas sometime at the end of this month or the first week of March. Haven't heard much about that, but, um, you know, uh, travel bubbles to Nepal and Sri Lanka are, uh, are almost uh, done and happening. So I'm, uh, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, uh, Indian travelers to these places uh, would probably be uh, around the block. I mean, will be coming up very, very soon. We've already started putting out uh, uh, press release uh, to say that you know these uh, things are happening but there's a little pause on that because uh, you know this this uh, you know when they, when they talk about uh, the, um, the bubbles there's also protocols to be set in place and those are between they've been worked out between the two countries so that is um, where we are standing having said that um, I mean everybody around uh, India has a lot you all know it's got 1.3 billion population to look at a vaccination um, you know to look at an agenda for vaccinating so many people is going to be uh, is going to be quite a challenge and there is um, you know a lot of private uh, companies a lot of corporations are coming forward to lend a hand and I think that could probably speed up the process I mean that's the whole idea uh, otherwise you know I've been traveling uh, you know flights are full domestic flights are all operational domestic flights are full uh, and, uh, you know, but uh, people are being careful. I mean, that's that's a good thing. There are, uh, you know, flights, especially they keep saying that there's a there's the safest places because I haven't heard of uh, this is my this is my 18th flight um, since September. And I haven't, uh, I mean, I test myself uh, pre-travel and post-travel because I have dogs and elderly uh, parents at home and I haven't seen um, you know, I, I haven't seen people breaking any regulations there. So at least for now, uh, the hoteliers especially, they are um, uh, making the most of the situation. And we hope um, international travel will begin if the visa situation improves. Otherwise, from the hotels that we market and we promote to, um, reinstating of uh, businesses for November from international markets are beginning to look up. Uh, don't know whether they'll operate, but at least the queries are, have started coming in for November, October, November, December 2021. Which is very much in line with what Mario was saying on certain things. Yes. So third, fourth quarter is where yes, yeah. ease, or it looks as if that's going to be. But of course, the situation is very, very fluid. So um, we don't know. Um, just yes, before. absolutely. Shoba, thank you very much for this overview. Um, we've talked a, a little bit about... Um, uh, airlines and you show us touched upon this so Mario when do you anticipate a recovery for the airlines for both domestic and international travel in terms of pre-COVID levels of arrival so will, will 2021 be the year of the travel bubble with New Zealand and Australia forming one and perhaps Hong Kong and Singapore to come yeah I mean certainly that the travel corridors or bubbles uh, I do I do expect we're going to see them probably sooner than we think between the destinations you've mentioned, Singapore, Hong Kong, or uh, Singapore and other destinations also within the region here. But the first question you ask is really about the airlines. The airlines, well, as you can all expect, are, are in a very, very peculiar situation at the moment. Uh, many of them were not doing so well before COVID-19, uh, and this situation has made, made it even worse. So my biggest fear and worry is that, you know, moving forward, as the situation start to gradually come back, you know, as I mentioned in the past, it's not that the flick of a switch and everything next tomorrow, we all go back to our past life and travel as we did before. It will be a slow recovery. It will be gradual. It will be destination by destination. So I would hate today to be you know, the network planner for an airline. It'll be an absolute nightmare of a job Night. trying to figure out where you position your aircraft tomorrow, 
Where are you going to fly in a year's time? How many aircraft do you, will you need? Um, you know, recently we, we had a, a webinar where we invited the CEO of Indigo Airline in India to, to speak. Um, and, you know, Indigo Airline is doing fantastically well. And the reason is because of domestic travel. Their flights are full. I mean, full, full. And he said, you know, sometimes we don't have enough airplane to cater for all the domestic flights. So all the international aircraft they had, or the majority of them, with a few exceptions, have been repositioned domestically, and they're actually doing well. So some, are, some airlines have been able to pivot into their domestic market and, and uh, do pretty well during this situation, but that's in one exception. The vast majority of them have actually downsized their aircraft fleet at the moment, uh, and, and their air uh, routes and et cetera to less than 20% or 10% of what it was before. And the forecast for the rest of the year is it's not going to be much more than what it is today. Uh, maybe slightly more in certain routes and versus others. So you know, when we talk about recovery, and I, I do want to stress when I answer this, that I'm actually talking about a global recovery and not a specific destination or a specific route, is that we forecast that by only by 2023, possibly 2024, we will be go back to the same level of growth that we had pre-COVID-19. Certainly based on what we've seen so far over the last 12 months in terms of what we've seen, how the situation is changing and evolving, uh, I think all international organizations are pretty much in line with, with this kind of scenario is where we're going to see a, a, a pre COVID-19 growth rate similar to what we had around that range of time. Things can shift, obviously, can either get better. I don't think it can get far more worse than what it is, but it can certainly improve. And I think it really depends on the rate of vaccination, the success of the vaccinations moving forward, and also these health protocols that I've talked about before. If those can happen at an accelerated pace, then I think we can see an earlier recovery. Uh, but as again, as I mentioned, this is a global response, not individual. Certain countries will do far, far better than others. Um, and it's an, as we said in our press release two weeks ago, it's going to be an uneven recovery. Some destinations are going to do fantastically well. Others might have to wait for a long time. If you look at destinations like Samoa, Samoa is not expected to get their vaccines until 2025. And, you know, they mainly live out of tourism. It's a huge problem for the country. It's a small country, but their survival is based on tourism. So I hope for them that either through the COVAX program for, with, from their World, uh, World Health Organization, they can accelerate the rate of vaccination in that country so they can actually go back and generate or you know, improve their economy moving forward. They're one example out of many other countries who are in a similar situation. I guess for some of these destinations where the plans are to have vaccines so late in the day, it's, it's going to be about a lot of lobbying with governments to try and fast track it, especially yeah. in the example you gave, because that really is not an acceptable situation to be in, to have it in so many years. No, I mean, many, many of the Pacific islands are, are you know, uh, tourism is key for them. Uh, and, and the situation is that some of the islands in the Pacific Already before COVID-19, uh, accessibility wasn't that great. Uh, there's one destination I traveled to in the Pacific two years ago where there's only one flight a week. There hasn't been any for several months. The only way they get their things at the moment is delivered by ship once a month. Um, so it's going back like it was decades ago. Uh, and so I, I do feel for some of these smaller island des uh, destinations who are really in a difficult situation at the moment. There has been a lot of talks here on, on, on the channels and on the news about um, countries having and sparing 10 or 20 percent of their vaccines to other countries in the world and help the global recovery. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see how, how that develops. But thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Mario. Amanda, how important has the domestic market been to the Viceroy Bali? We talked about domestic um, quite a lot already. So how yeah. important has it been? To the uh, 
prior to COVID, it was not a market for us at all. It is for some hotels in Bali, particularly the market coming out of Jakarta, Surabaya, even business travel and conferences. They've had this ongoing domestic market since really they were founded. But for us, it has just never been a market. We're always focused on UK, Europe, US, we're our top three. Um, and now we've had to obviously pivot is the word of the year, but we've tried to pivot more to the domestic market. But what we're seeing is really that that has been established and there are other five star hotels in Bali that already have a great market there. So a few of the DMCs in Bali did the same thing where they normally focus on international. They started looking at domestic, but they found the same thing. There were already well established DMCs that focused on domestic. Plus, you've got your online um, travel agents. So for us, we did see a little bit of a pickup over Christmas uh, and domestics been open to Bali since the end of July last year. And you'll see a few bookings come in here and there. And we've even had some really great bookings that have stayed one week longer. Uh, but overall, that's not even putting a dent in it. I think we're, our bookings are down about 95%. Uh, but what is nice i guess is for us the restaurants so we've kept both of our restaurants open and particularly our fine dining restaurant aperitif is doing very well considering it's the pandemic um business hasn't really slowed compared to normal years what we're finding is expats and locals are looking for fine dining experiences within bali when normally they would be traveling to other countries they'd be going to singapore or hong kong for great restaurants and food uh, they are doing that now within bali which is nice to see so of course there's still birthdays and wedding anniversaries and all of those events still happen and so from the restaurant side of things we have seen a nice pickup and all of the restaurant owners and chefs around Bali have been working together. So we're doing a lot of collaborations. We'll go down to the coast to a different hotel or restaurant, vice versa. So that is a positive note coming out of Bali that there's a lot of dining and particularly fine dining happening. Uh, but from the hotel point of view, the local market for us is not, not a starter. Mm. I mean, you, you just remind me about a friend of mine who um, transferred in, in Oman, um, for, for work purpose, him and his family. And he was actually telling me that um, he's visiting the local um, hotels to just give him and his family a break and go mm. dine there. Um, so I guess this is a trend that we're not seeing just in Bali, but in many other regions in Asia and around the world. Uh, people are, are um, starting to look at closer by escapes, which is good course, news. Yeah. So and particularly from that. business owners in Bali, we are all visiting each other's businesses. So my weekends are packed full of going to other hotels, going to restaurants, this and that, making sure that we're out and about and spending what we have on other businesses. And you do see it is re reciprocated then. People are coming to us. So this was not established ahead of the pandemic? This no, no, no. So the expat market in Bali traditionally wouldn't go to fine dining on the island or if they did it was once in a blue moon but now we're seeing weekly people are coming to for example our ladies night in the bar every week or certain events we're having um, a couple of piano performances this is and that so this market was not at all there we relied ma mainly on the hotel guests for our restaurants and also international tourists mm. so shoba has there been a new education for domestic travelers when it comes to rediscovering their own backyard yeah, hugely, hugely, especially uh, with the hotels like um, uh, like ours, uh, which are generally off the beaten track and uh, more often than not in places that are not, uh, you, know, you know, they're not really a, a point on the tourist map. Uh, it really uh, meant that Indians were out there discovering new places. Uh, they also just like uh, Amanda pointed out. Uh, the minute um, you know, the the minute the the uh, the, the lockdown lifted, um, you know, even even though it was partially lifted uh, in August, there were these concepts like um, remote uh, work from a remote location, work from the hills, work from the uh, you know beach destination. So a lot of these concepts were put out. Uh, the the good thing is that um, you know uh, India has a has an outbound uh, market which is about. 18 million people, that's what, I mean, 18 million passengers, that's what they say. And uh, a lot of them uh, are able to, you know, they have the ability and now the time to um, actually stay at, uh, 
some of the more uh, off the beaten track areas where uh, the, the pricing is also quite high. And one of the things I wanted to pick up from Amanda's uh, description about what their DMCs are doing, in India, unfortunately, not many uh, DMCs that, uh, that dealt with the inbound market was able to pivot to the uh, domestic market. It's a, it's a very, um, very different market. It's a, it's a highly uh, competitive market. It's also a market that uh, doesn't, uh, you know, that also tries to venture out and, uh, you know, they're very savvy on their phones. They go and do their research quite a bit. So uh, it's, it was not very easy. So I didn't, uh, I mean, I haven't heard of uh, many, I mean, there are a few examples, good examples also, but not so many uh, DMCs who've kind of made a pivot to uh, handling their own uh, countrymen, for instance. So yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, there is a lot of um, there's a lot of travel happening for the uh, Indian uh, travelers. Some of my hotels decided to stay shut, especially those that are uh, in the vicinity of small community and uh, you know uh, small villages and things like that, because they really wanted to keep the community um, uh, isolated from any instances. Uh, and like I mentioned to you before, there are some um, hotels even if. Uh, the state uh, did not require a COVID uh, negative certificate. They insisted that anybody coming and staying in their community, in their locality, where the community engagement is very, very high, they would definitely want to see them with a COVID negative certificate. That actually worked very well for them because it just also made sure that travelers were very comfortable going. Uh, Indians travel as families. Right, so there's a lot of uh, elder, older, elderly aunts and parents going with them. So this kind of a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, uh, changes to the travel scenarios happened, and huge amount of takeaways. Mm. The th thank you very much, Shoba. Um, I guess yes, it, it's really it's really difficult to um, keep up with the acute eyes of the domestic market when they search a lot and you know the, the competition must be fierce for those that have, have stayed open and are staying open. Um, Mario, I wanted to ask you, the Spring Festival Golden Week, I, I understand that has just come to an end. Um, do you think that this holiday has given a, a bit of, of a boost uh, for the recovery for China? Um, yes and no. Um, Actually, the Moon Festival, which was back in October, was a, you know, very, very successful for China. It was over 600 million people traveled domestically in China. Uh, but the new year, we don't have the figures yet, uh, but it, it wasn't as good. And the reason for this is actually the government had actually asked people not to travel. Um, and if when the Chinese government asks you not to travel, you don't travel. <laughs> so there were there were a lot less people who actually travel between borders, between uh, uh, states or provinces to go and visit their family because of the instruction of the government. They had some researchers of new cases appearing recently in some provinces. So there was a, an encouragement not to. It was not a ban. It was just not encouraged uh, to travel. So I don't have the figures yet. However, I do have other figures that I actually found quite interesting. I was talking to our China office this morning, and uh, we're talking about the situation of the uh, Chinese outbound market, which uh, a lot of us in different parts of the world have benefited from the number of Chinese traveling overseas. And I was asking them, I said, you know, will China open its border uh, sometime this year to allow foreigners to travel in, or more importantly, for Chinese to travel out, which is the interest of many of us around here today. Um, and it's an unlikely uh, that they will continue to keep their border closed for the time being, at least for, for the rest of the year. This is not an official response from the government, uh, but certainly what the feeling is from the industry at the moment is that government will unlikely actually open their borders. If they do, it will be on specific cases as Singapore is doing for business purposes uh, and, and uh, very, very specific itineraries and et cetera that will be actually done. The consequences of this is they said actually 10,000 uh, tour operators and travel agencies in China have closed permanently and will not reopen. Um, so it's a huge number. Uh, I mean, in, in, in a you know, big scheme in China, it's probably actually a small number, but it's still a fairly large amount of tour operators that are actually closed their business uh, for the time being. Big, big focus on domestic tourism in China, uh, which they already had a very, very strong market before that. Um, 
and will continue to, to do so. Uh, here in Thailand, the domestic market actually has been very good. Obviously, it doesn't replace international. Uh, international tourism represents about 20% of our GDP. It's 20%, uh, 21% of employment in a country. So you can imagine you know, the severe impact on the economy around here has, has been really difficult. I don't know the exact number, but thousands of businesses have also closed in Thailand. Um, and uh, again, we have no sign of reopening our border until the end of the year at the moment. Um, so similar situation here than, than other places. Uh, the government did actually last year introduce a program where they were giving subsidies to uh, Thai citizens uh, to who wants to enjoy a domestic holiday. Uh, it was 3,000 baht, the equivalent of about $100 uh, for uh, each family or each individual, each Thai citizen, uh, to go and enjoy a domestic holiday. And there were an additional a couple thousands of baht also available for food and beverage and et cetera, as you enjoy your holiday. Uh, they've done that twice, actually. They did start it first, and it got extremely popular. Uh, domestic hotels got booked really, really fast. Sadly, not in Bangkok, but outside of the city. Um, and they did a second time. Uh, interesting, just a week ago, uh, the governor of the uh, Tourism Authority of Thailand mentioned the possibility of doing another such initiative, but for air, because the airline are suffering very, even more at the moment of giving an incentive for Thai citizens to travel domestically by air. And so essentially covering their airfare for one holiday uh, in a place of their choice in, in Thailand. Uh, it's not official yet, but it's a proposal that they actually put forward to the government, try to entice people to travel. The reason they're talking about it now is our new year is coming up. Uh, our new year in Thailand is in April, Songkran, uh, which is actually, uh, well, if you combine your long weekends before and after, it's almost uh, a week up to 10 days of holiday uh, for everyone. It's normally a very, very busy period um, domestically in Thailand during that time. And uh, so um, we anticipate that unless there are actually a resurgence of cases again, that uh, it will be an, again, a very popular uh, holiday. I guess uh, if, if you are a travel agent or tour operator or, or even just an outlet, you have to be very quick on your feet to uh, refocus or not, not to refocus, actually to focus on the domestic market to grasp the opportunity. And it's not easy for, for everyone, which is why of so many businesses and there is a metamorphosis ha happening in the industry as we are all witnessing really, not only in Asia, but all over the world. So, Yeah, some businesses have been able to pivot and do other activities, but it's not suitable for all businesses. Some are actually, we're uh, very, very focused on the international market for very long to have necessarily the contact or the business relationship to be able to pivot as fast as maybe others have done. Uh, who grabbed the marketplace before they did, uh, and therefore, you know, this is why we've seen many businesses closing or even just changing sector completely, going into other sectors. I guess the vaccine is a lifeline for a lot of countries, well, all of the countries really, and um, that slow moving and opening, it'll take some time, as, as you rightly said at the beginning. Amanda, what uh, new trends are you seeing as a result of this shift in mindset? Well, at the moment for the domestic market, what we're seeing is very last minute bookings. So people are even actually physically walking into the hotel to check it out, to see a room and then deciding whether they'll book. They'll book for a few nights, then extend, 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 which is just sort of unheard of that people would walk into the hotel to see what it is. But I guess everything's so, uh, they, you're guaranteed to have vacancies at the moment so people are doing that we're also seeing um longer stays so like i said they'll book a few nights usually three to four nights was our length of stay for international tourists uh people are staying a week or more at now uh i think definitely the trends that we're going to see or different mindset particularly for bali and the indonesian government is trying to help with that is a more of a wellness focus and ecotourism and so whilst everyone's been talking about wellness travel for a long time I think there will actually be that trend coming out of the pandemic. One, because people have been stressed and stuck at home and there's been a certain amount of mental exertion to that. Uh, and Bali's well placed for that. So already Ubud where we are, 
was seen as a wellness and a, um, I guess, spiritual journey destination. But we are pivoting then for the hotel also to uh, increase our uh, focus there. So we're building a whole new gymnasium and spa and squash courts and everything around that because we think that people will be staying longer and they'll wanting, be wanting to put together these programs even more than they have in previous years. Uh, also because we're private pool villas, we're now seeing people asking a lot of questions about, around that and the processes and protocols you've got in place. They like having their own pool. They want to have uh, sort of service direct to the villa rather than sitting in restaurants, of course. Um, and Indonesian government has then put in place also what they're calling it is CHSE, which is they came out and um, analyzed your protocols, your new COVID, and you get this tick you could put on your website and display, which particularly for those currently in Indonesia, they understand and know what that, it is, that is. Uh, so I think shifting mindset for me would then just be wellness focused. Also the um, Minister for Tourism and Creative Economy here has started working from Bali, which is positive. And he's trying to then um, shift the focus to being able to work from different locations. Cause now we all know we can zoom in to meetings and we all know we can do most of the work remotely. So I think that will be another big step for Bali. Big shifts all around, big shifts in mindset. Thank you, Amanda. Shoba, what information do you think is important to relay to travel agents at this moment? Uh, in, in the sense of uh, uh, people wanting to come into India? Yeah, um, in, in, in the sense of Indian travelers wanting to explore destinations from sustainability. Um, so what, what information do you think um, it is important for them to, to have at the moment? Yeah. With yeah, I, I actually I quite agree with Amanda about this whole wellness um, wellness bit. I think that's going to be a very key focus area uh, for people to be, um, you know, uh, wanting wellness within and without. So which means um, we're looking at personal wellness and also wanting to understand and contribute to the well, well-being of the planet. I think these two points are really well taken. Though I don't see, um, I'm not seeing the kind of... Um, numbers that I'd like to see for, you know, like people saying, oh, we are only going to look at places that have the, uh, you know, uh, green, uh, uh, green tag or ecotourism or eco responsible or whatever tag that they want to carry. But I can see that a lot more awareness has gone into, at least they are listening to us. We've been advocating this since 2009. And at least they're listening to us. Otherwise, I'm like a like somebody like a scratch record, you know, stuck the needle stuck at one point, constantly saying the same thing that the uh, destination needs to be pristine, hold on to its integrity, the community needs to be to be uh, to benefit and things like that. But so uh, one point I would uh, definitely like and uh, tour operators listening in that the way the, to, you know, to put out these, um, these points about um, about personal wellness, about um, safety and hygiene, uh, about preserving our heritage, and also uh, thinking about what the hotel or the destination is doing um, in terms of preservation and uh, you know, looking at uh, the, the, the environment when they are putting out hospitality products is one of the key marketing factors that you, they would want to put out. Instead of just saying, listen, we are, uh, we are, I mean, there's always this price war uh, in, uh, you know, in places in India where, you know, the larger chains are able to give much better price points, while uh, the smaller hotels really cannot go down to that kind of pricing. But in our marketing, uh, uh, in our marketing and promotion and trying to sell a hotel, we can actually say we are expensive because uh, you will be contributing to keeping the planet safe and well with a with a lower carbon footprint, or you will be uh, you will be responsible and you will be contributing to keeping up this particular heritage tradition and things like that. So I think that is one of the things that we've been pushing for. And I, though I uh, I don't like the the sound of um, revenge tourism, but there definitely is a is a big shift in numbers where uh, where domestic tourism is concerned and. The travel agents have to start looking at newer and fresher narratives to be promoting. And uh, one of the things that I think is very important is the relevance of the tour operator is is uh, you know is something uh, that has come back into focus. And people will look at a tour operator 
to find out places that are safe, that are, uh, that are hygienic, that are following protocols, uh, which are you know, genuinely concerned about the points, uh, about safety, about environment, and about people. Uh, I think that is something that I think we will come back into focus and people will definitely be, be referring these points when they are choosing um, any destination for a holiday. I think At least I hope so. I, I think I, I, was, I was thinking um, um, this weekend about um, where to go when lockdown eases and what to do. And um, whether before I was a self-made type, type of traveler, whether I would choose places to go, I definitely need a travel agent now because it, it is um, a maze out there and you need that knowledge um, in understanding how to, how, to, um, how to guide yourself and have a bit of the roadmap. Mario, can you share, talking of roadmap, can you share with us a, a roadmap of the vaccination rollout planned across Asia Pacific? And I know you've touched upon it earlier and you said that every country has its own, but could you give us a little bit of a flair of where you see this roadmap um, happening across, across Asia Pacific? Yeah, the, the Economist actually published a chart, I think it was maybe two, week, two weeks ago on the weekend, where they actually showed the rollout of the vaccines across the Asia Pacific regions um, and which countries will get vaccinated up to 60, 70%, which is uh, apparently the average needed in order to reduce number of cases. Uh, as I mentioned before, Singapore, Hong Kong, Chinese Taipei are uh, the fastest in terms of vaccination at the moment, will reach that goal of 60, 70%, probably even more than that, if not completely uh, by the fourth quarter of this year, if not third quarter of this year, or certainly for Singapore. Uh, other destinations will take far longer. Uh, Thailand, for example, is expected to be completed or to reach that level by the third quarter 2022, which is quite, quite far. Um, other countries in the region will be between uh, first and second uh, quarter of 2022. If I think of Vietnam, Cambodia, for example, uh, are, are actually... Uh, accelerating quite well in that area. But other countries such as Nepal, for example, is not expected until 2023. Um, and other countries in the region, the same thing. It goes all the way, as I mentioned before, of places like uh, Samoa until 2025. Uh, other countries in, in the Pacific, Fiji, uh, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Island, for example, uh, are also in that same list of 24, in some cases, 25. So it's, it's, it's extremely uneven uh, across the region here. I'm not, no, China, Japan, Korea uh, are started, uh, China certainly have started way before everybody else, but also have a very large population. Uh, Japan and Korea are only starting, uh, just started uh, Japan recently and Korea this week. Uh, but also we know that they're a very efficient uh, society. So they'll probably actually get vaccinated quite fast when they get, or when they get set up and organized. Uh, so it, it is very uneven uh, across each destination. Um, I think the governments are also each uh, learning how to get more efficient at it. Uh, we've seen it in the UK. Uh, first couple of weeks, it was a disaster in terms of vaccination. It was completely disorganized. Now, actually, they're actually one of the leading destinations in, in Europe who, well, sorry, no longer Europe, in that part of the world, <laughs> who are actually accelerating their, their vaccination now 15 million nearly 20 million people vaccinated. So they, they learn how to become more productive and efficient. Uh, and I suspect the same will apply here across Asia Pacific moving forward. Absolutely. Um, I'm just very conscious of time. I have a, a few more questions for the panelists, but I'd like to give the opportunity to um, our delegates who's joined to, to ask any questions. And there are a few already that have been private message me. So one of them is Paola. Perhaps Paola, you'd like to unmute yourself and ask, ask the question directly. And um, in the meantime, anyone else that has a question, please put it on the chat and we will ensure that, um, that the panelists will be able to, to answer it. Paola. Hi. hi, hi guys. Good morning to you from Dublin. Um, my question is uh, in relation to, um, you know, to everyone, so anyone that can help clarify this uh, question, um, do you actually think that the difficulties the hotels and DMCs are experiencing in, uh, in uh, 
in respect to what you were saying that it you know the the domestic uh, market is actually quite um, you know it's a, it's quite savvy right boils down to actually cost because you know i've always been an advocate that um you know being half italian half irish that uh you know reality is the majority of the of the properties that i was uh, dealing with did not pay attention to um, the domestic market at all. And I've always felt it was ridiculous. I've always felt that uh, the majority of the people I was talking to in the industry could not afford um, literally to do, you know, vacation in their own home country. And I, I wonder if now that not has come to, you know, to play because obviously, you know, I always think that I, uh, Ireland, you know, in relation to our market here, if it wasn't for Irish people, the hotels would have been empty. The same with Italy and, I'm, you know, from what it looks like everywhere in the world. So I wonder if the strategy has to be retaught and I wonder if, you know, everything should be analyzed a little bit more in terms of our hotel functions. What are the relationship with, uh, you know, obviously the DMC and travel agents and if all the industry should really get a wake up call as a whole. I don't know, just... I can maybe answer from, from, from the destination's point of view, and I'll let Amanda and Soba answer from, from the private sector point of view, but certainly from, from the destinations, the destination marketing organizations or National Tourism Board, uh, many of them actually in the region here are slightly reorganizing themselves to have a much stronger team now with a focus on domestic tourism, but so to ensure they don't have all their eggs in the same basket, uh, to be more resilient moving forward, and having a little bit of a little bit of both, uh, it's still going to be probably a smaller team than the international on a long-term basis because they do want to bring back the international uh, because typically people will stay longer, uh, they'll typically spend more money uh, as opposed to locals who will normally go out for a long weekend for three four days uh, and, and spend obviously less in that period of time. But I think that right balance is what is needed moving forward. So many of the national tourism board, as I mentioned, are internally reorganizing themselves and also looking at their marketing campaign because the marketing message to the domestic market will be quite different from the international point of view. Um, but uh, I, I'd like to hear also from the private sector point of view of uh, their views. Uh, from my perspective, yes, you're correct uh, that we had not focused on domestic before, but there's tens of thousands of hotels or homestays in Bali at different price points. And, there was, there's a lot that already do cater to that market at say your $100 a night property at sort of that nice four star level, I guess. Uh, why we didn't focus on domestic before now is because the rates that you can charge for the majority of the domestic Indonesian are so low that we'd be running basically just break even because we've got, you know, heated swimming pools in every room. We've got 160 staff for 30 rooms, that sort of thing. So the market never really factored in for us because of the price point that we run at um, and the high level that we want to maintain. Uh, in terms of markets, we thought we were being smart. So no one market globally was our key market. We had about highest was about 21% from the US and then each other market sat at about 13, 14%. So if we did lose one market or say because of Brexit, the UK wasn't traveling for a year or there's some sort of economic downturn somewhere or a natural disaster, then it wasn't affecting us at all until of course the whole world shut down. Um, so, but definitely we'll have to look at the domestic market going forward, but from a price point for us, it's almost not worth it if we want to maintain our standard and what we've been trying to do, because the margin we're getting on our rooms at the moment is just so low with that domestic market. No, but, but that's exactly, that, that is the point. The point is that often, you know, like if, if, we, if we were doing a business plan for a new business and you were literally looking at cost, you know, it would like literally the cost would outnumber the profit and therefore it's not viable. And I think the, the travel industry has been has been thriving exactly on that. We move people because we cannot afford to offer our services to the locals, you know, but I think it, 
you know, I, I really it, wish a, the industry would change. Oversupply. Sorry? Yeah, there's an oversupply of hotels in Bali. Um, and so you can't all go for that same market. And at the moment, we've definitely all got the same market. But, but I, I wonder, think... Amanda, though, if uh, actually it's not about uh, just, uh, uh, you know, an overflow of, of, uh, of properties, of hotels in Bali. I think also if maybe the structure are the way the government structures are in terms even of, of, uh, of taxes, it's penalizing the industry. And that is yeah. why I think, I hope, I have been a, you know, I, I'm one of those people myself that I always think that when there is a problem, we can't just simply look at our industry and stay with that. I think we need to look at who is around our industry, who's feeding our industry, and what bad behavior has been literally there forever and ever, and we just simply put up with it. Because I don't think it's just a matter of commissions on our side in terms of, for example, DMC and travel agent, where I come to a hotel and say, I need 15% to survive. And you're telling me, you know, I, I, it, I find it difficult to give you that much because of my over, overrides cost, you know? So I just wonder if we need to look at the industry a little bit on a wider spectrum and just literally, call, you know what I mean? What is the, yeah. I think, but, yeah. I think Paula, do, yeah. I'm going yeah. to have to Sorry. Um, interrupt Sorry. you here, guys, because um, at nine, well, we are one minute past. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are uh, present that are joining meetings, yeah, meetings and are already yeah. one minute late. So I just wanted to uh, thank you guys and thank you all. Um, I might um, put in touch Paula and Shoba later yeah. so you can continue the conversation. We have, we have a meeting, so we will talk. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, talk about it. Yes, fantastic. thank you, Paula. Yeah. I just okay. wanted to thank you all so much, um, Amanda, Shoba and Mario for your time and your insightful remarks. This is the end of the session.